in my view, you would not have seen anything like the inflation that we have seen without the pandemic effects. And those pandemic effects include both shifts, shifts in demand and also playing a, a, a role in, not solely causing, but playing a role in the supply side constraints that emerged. So as for the pandemic, um, it, it did lead directly to an extraordinary shift in demand away from in-person services and to goods. And that shift, of course, was a major contributor to inflation in goods prices, which was really the main inflation story at the very beginning when when, when inflation broke out suddenly in March of, of uh, 2021. Hold on, bro. Let me play that back. What the f When inflation broke out suddenly. When inflation broke out suddenly. When inflation broke out suddenly. <laughs> Hence, as we say in our statement, with inflation running persistently below 2%, we will aim to achieve inflation moderately above 2% for some time, so that inflation averages 2% over time, and longer-term inflation expectations remain well anchored at 2%. We expect to maintain an accommodative stance of monetary policy until these outcomes, including maximum employment, are achieved. With regard to interest rates, we now indicate that we expect it will be appropriate to maintain the current 0 to 1 quarter percent target range for the federal funds rate until labor market conditions have reached levels, levels consistent with the committee's assessments of maximum employment and inflation has risen to 2 percent and is on track to moderately exceed 2 percent for some time. In addition, <clears throat> over coming months, we will continue to increase our holdings of Treasury securities and agency mortgage-backed securities, at least at the current pace. These asset purchases are intended to sustain smooth, smooth market, market functioning. In seeking to achieve inflation at average percent over time, we are not tying ourselves to a particular mathematical formula that defines the average. Thus, our approach, approach could be viewed as a flexible form of average inflation targeting. Our decisions about appropriate monetary policy will continue to reflect a broad array of considerations and will not be dictated by any formula. <laughs> It wasn't me. It wasn't me. Today is Thursday, the 8th of September. This is a recap for the stock market activities today. And folks, I got a good one for you tonight, but let's start with this. My condolences to our British viewers on the passing of the Queen today. It is certainly an end of an era, but life has to go on. And in tonight's program, we're going to cover a lot of topics. Most importantly, how the Fed Chairman Jerome Powell is evading responsibility when it comes to inflation. We will also cover how the Fed is speaking with both sides of the mouth when it comes to tackling inflation and their commitment to tightening the monetary policy. We will also talk about a phenomenon that will become more relevant in the days to come. And this happens to be the collision course between Jerome Powell, the chairman of the Fed of the United States, and Madame Lagarde, the head of the ECB. Yep, they're about to collide in a big way, and the ramifications could not be any more important than this. And with that further ado, here it is, in focus tonight. It wasn't me. That's what Jerome Powell says. Uh, what, what inflation? I don't know nothing about nothing. I didn't do nothing. Inflation just popped out of nowhere. Okay, Mr. Powell, you want to play this game? Let's play this game. I'm going to expose your ass for everybody to see. But before we do that, remember legendary economist Milton Friedman back in the 70s and 80s? He led the monetary movement, which pretty much says that inflation has always, always 
been a monetary phenomenon. You can say it's a supply issue. You can say, oh, the tornado, the hurricane, the earthquake, uh, the alignment between Jupiter and the moon. That's all good. But at the end of the day, there hasn't been one episode of sustainable inflation without an increase in the money supply. Likewise, there hasn't been any single episode of inflation that did not respond to monetary tightening. What does that mean? The original source of inflation is the monetary policy. And the cure comes also from the monetary policy. Hence, we as the public, we place a lot of trust in the Federal Reserve to do the right thing. We know back in 2020, the Fed panicked and oversupplied the economy with a tsunami of liquidity, the likes that we have never seen before in history. And as a result, the Fed ended up overstimulating an economy that did not need stimulation at all. The millions of jobs that we lost back in 2020, that was a self-inflicted wound because it was due to the shutdowns and the lockdowns. Hence, the cure for that episode of unemployment was not and should have never came from the monetary policy. Our health officials and politicians were in charge. And the moment they decided to reopen the economy, we saw a massive acceleration in recovering all of these jobs that we lost during the shutdowns. And that leaves us with with the overstimulation that the Fed has done. And the byproduct of this overstimulation and the tsunami of liquidity is inflation. It doesn't take a genius to figure this out. The problem is, the chairman of the Fed, Jerome Powell, continues to deny any responsibility at all from the monetary policy in creating this inflation. He blames everything under the sun, but the insane increase in the money supply. Listen to Professor Steve Hankey from John Hopkins. The Fed chairman and the Fed governors have not been looking at the money supply. They've, they've been trying to convince us that inflation is caused by something else besides growth in the money supply. You mentioned transitory. Remember those supply chain shocks and Putin and oil prices and this and that, everything under the sun but money. And, and actually, Chairman Powell did testify before Congress indicating that the money supply really didn't have any uh, connection with economic activity. So, so that's the background. And, and still, even in his Jackson Hole speech, Chairman Powell never admitted that he understood where inflation was coming from, and he never mentioned the money supply. And unfortunately, today, in a disgusting manner, Jerome Powell, with no shame at all, doubled down on his stand that he is not responsible at all when it comes to this inflation. The monetary policy did not produce this inflation, and inflation just uh, popped out of nowhere. Take a look. So I, I too, I graduated from college in 1975, uh, which was close to peak monetarism, and there, there was quite a focus on monetary aggregates, and I, I recall it just as you do. Um, so. To, to, to go to this current situation. So as part of our response to the pandemic, we did resort to uh, large asset purchases to address what were pretty severe disruptions in markets, and then also to support the economy and our balance sheet expanded dramatically. But remember that our, our purchases of securities don't actually increase the, the quantity of, of government obligations held by the public. They really change the mix because we issue bank reserves to pay for those securities. So we're not changing you know, the, the quantity of, of obligations. That is not to say that, that money growth wasn't high. It was, of course, extraordinarily high in 2020 and then slowed down in 21 and now is, now is quite sluggish. And I, I guess I would just say, say it this way. Um, whatever caused, you know, there are different theories on what caused the inflation that so suddenly jumped up uh, out of the ground in March of 2021. Whatever that cause was, the relationship between the money supply and inflation, economic output, has been uh, much more unstable than it was in Friedman's day for a very long time. And so uh, literally changes in monetary aggregates have, have not had a consistent, reliable relationship. They haven't been a good predictor of the economy or of inflation. Now, of course, the economy is ever changing, and, and that too could change. Uh, you know, to where it is uh, important again. But but for now, and for, for really many years now, monetary aggregates don't play an important role in our formulation of policy. And we don't think they're generally a good way to think about policy or about inflation. It's more about demand and supply and things like that. Now, all of this is bullshit, of course. We know the reason behind this inflation is the misguided monetary policy, creating excess all over the economy. And now to remove this excess, the Fed has to tighten the monetary policy. The problem is, can they do that surgically and get the excess only, or are they going to end up extracting the excess 
and then some. And this is the part of the conversation when we talk about the Fed overdoing the tightening and perhaps pushing the economy into a severe recession. And of course, since recently Jerome Powell has been channeling Volcker, he's not even close to becoming a, um, a piece of lint on Volcker's shoes, let alone to become Volcker. But regardless, let the man fantasize for a little bit. But for now, he thinks that he needs to be as aggressive as he can to tackle inflation down. And he will not stop until the job is done. The problem is, Mr. Powell suffered from a credibility issue. And the reason is back in 2018, 2019, he said he will tighten the monetary policy and bring back interest rates back to normal. When the stock market started to go down in response to this, he famously pivoted and decided to cut interest rates once again to appease the stock market. And therefore, it doesn't matter if Mr. Powell says, I'm going to do whatever it needs to be done until the job is done. We have to see it to believe it. Otherwise, the stock market will be skeptical. And we will see dips being bought. We will see a resurgence of the many episodes, just like we saw a few weeks ago during the so-called summer rally. And this will loosen financial conditions once again, making the Fed engaged in a cat and mouse game that will prove to be extremely dangerous for this economy. And therefore, the Fed has to walk the walk and be as aggressive as they need to be to tackle this inflation down. Remember, when Volcker was the chairman of the Fed, he raised interest rates above the inflation rate. Right now, the Fed funds rate stands at 2.5%. The inflation rate above 8%. So we're not even close to tackling inflation down. The Fed remains a follower sitting in the passenger seat while inflation remains in the driver's seat for now. The problem is the conversation in Wall Street, not a surprise of course, is dominated with one risk. And that risk is what if the Fed overdo the tightening? we go into a severe recession. And perhaps we're seeing inflation cooling down. Maybe it is time for the Fed to back off. Once again, a reminder, the inflation rate above 8%, the Fed funds rate at 2.5%. And there is another risk. And that risk is, what if the Fed prematurely backs off and stops tightening the monetary policy aggressively. That risk will be a resurgence of inflation. And then once again, it becomes a dangerous game of a cat and mouse chase, which could be disastrous for this economy. So the Fed must not waver on their commitment of tackling this inflation down. But here's the problem. The Fed is already speaking with both sides of the mouth. Yesterday, Vice Chairman Brain did, who was one heartbeat away from becoming chairwoman, she came out with the hawkish rhetoric, of course, vowing that the Fed will be in this for as long as it takes to stop inflation. The problem is, she also spoke with both sides of the mouth. I know what they're trying to do. They're trying to have their cake and eat it too. On one hand, the Fed wants to be as tough as they can, at least from an appearance perspective, because they have a credibility crisis. But on the other hand, they're also consumed with appeasing the stock market, Wall Street, the oligarchs, by reassuring everybody that they are aware with the risk of over-tightening. The problem is, the stock market listens to one side of that conversation, which is, oh, the Fed is aware of the risk of over-tightening, meaning they're about to pivot. So that thinking has to be completely erased from the stock market right now. Otherwise, the Fed will never be able to tackle this inflation at all. Federal Reserve Vice Chair Brain did vowed Wednesday to press the fight against inflation that she said is hurting lower-income Americans the most. Oh, you think? We are in this for as long as it takes takes to get inflation down, she said. And this comes just two weeks before the Fed's next policy meeting. She also added, so far, we have expeditiously raised the policy rate to the peak of the previous cycle, and the policy rate will need to rise further. Adding, with a series of inflationary supply shocks, it is especially important to guard against the risk that households and businesses could start to expect inflation to remain above 2% in the longer run, which would make it much more challenging to bring inflation down to our target, and that target is 2%. The vice chair also said monetary policy will need to be restrictive for some time to provide confidence that inflation is moving down to target. Wait a minute here, I thought Jerome Powell said the monetary policy has nothing to do with inflation. So why is the cure to the illness is via the monetary policy? Mm. Anyways, the economic environment is highly uncertain, and the path of policy will be data-dependent. Here comes the pivot. This is the problem with these zombies. They speak with both sides of the mouth. This will mean more interest rate increases and keeping rates higher for longer, she said in remarks prepared for a speech in New York. However, and listen to this, Brain did cushion the comments with an acknowledgement that policymakers will be data-dependent and conscious of overdoing tightening. Um, the Fed funds rate at 2.5% 
inflation rate is above 8%, what over-tightening are you even talking about right now? Anyhow, she says at some point in the tightening cycle, the risks will become more two-sided. The rapidity of the tightening cycle and its global nature, as well as the uncertainty around the pace at which the effects of tighter financial conditions are working their way through aggregate demand, create risks associated with over-tightening. <laughs> And this is, of course, what the stock market needed to hear to blast higher right away. Stocks rallied after the remarks as investors look for signs the Fed is committing to bringing down inflation without going too far. Once again, inflation rate over 8%, some would argue it is actually double digits right now, yet the Fed funds rate at 2.5%. So why all the talk about over-tightening right now, besides appeasing Wall Street and the oligarchs and saying, okay, we got you, we know. And now we have uh, Tesla witch, Mama Kathy Wood. She says that Jerome Powell should put away the Paul Volcker sledgehammer. Honey, what the hell are you talking about? Volcker raised interest rates at some point by over 200 basis points in a single meeting. He got the Fed funds rate above the CPI at the time, all the way to 20%. That's how he killed inflation. Jerome Powell is still at 2.5%. Mama Kathy says, oh, that's enough, that's enough. You know why? Because Mama Kathy and the rest of these Wall Streeters types, they're looking at their books, they're over leveraged once these interest rates start to move higher, their funds will blow up entirely. They don't care about the economy. They don't care about the middle class. They don't care about the poor. They don't care about the American dream. They don't care about housing affordability. They don't care about anything at all but their own book. And their books are about to explode. Once again, the Fed is a follower, not a leader. Sure, inflation goes down from 8.5% to 7.8%. Who cares? The risk becomes the Fed saying, ah, oh, look at this. It is working. The tightening is working. They ease their foot. The dollar goes down. Commodities resurge higher. There we go. The cat and mouse game. Look at the CPI back in the 70s. It went down only to come back better, stronger, and with such veracity. You want to talk about build back better? It's going to happen in inflation if the Fed pivots or even talks about easing. Now, here's perhaps where the pivot is going to happen. And it might be forced, but it is really complicated. What are you talking about, Maverick? I'm talking about this. You might have heard today or seen that Madame Lagarde from the ECB, the delusional madwoman, was talking at the same time when Clown Powell was talking. Is this a coincidence? Is this done by design? Well, I say it is symbolic because, you see, the inflation problem in Europe is a lot larger than it is in the United States for many other reasons, energy prices, etc., etc. But also, a major contributor to inflation in the European continent is the euro. The euro is crashing, and it lost an important trend line, as you can see from the chart, that goes all the way back till the 80s. Now, as the euro is crashing, inflation is surging higher. European inflation is at 9.1% right now. Look, we can spend an entire hour talking about why, when the value of a certain currency goes down, inflation kicks up higher. But there is a correlation. When the value of the currency goes down, inflation goes higher. When the value of the currency goes higher, inflation goes down. So what we're seeing right now is an interesting phenomenon. Madame Lagarde came out in the morning and announced the ECB rate hikes of 75 basis points. Major rate hike. Now, you would think with this rate hike, the euro should have traded higher. The problem is... The opposite happened. The euro went down and the dollar went higher as Jerome Powell started speaking. Now, what does that mean? It means that Madame Lagarde is failing miserably in tackling inflation, even with the 75 basis points hike, because Jerome Powell is ruining everything she's doing. We have this race right now. Lagarde wants to tighten the monetary policy aggressively to tackle down inflation. Of course, she's Johnny come lately. She should have done that last year. But you know what? So is Jerome Powell. He's also tightening. He's pushing the value of the dollar up, which pushes the value of the euro down. And this is the collision course that we have. So what is the resolution here? Because if the Fed continues to tighten aggressively, the value of the dollar will shoot up higher and the euro will go down. What does that mean? Should the ECB be become even more aggressive and raise interest rates by 100 basis points, how about 150, how about 200, how about 300, and now we get to the risk of overdoing it and crushing the economy into a severe recession. And what is the alternative? For Powell to back down? Okay, let's say Powell backs down, he says 50 basis points in September, and then 25 what do you know? The dollar goes down, the euro surges higher, but guess what else happens? As the dollar goes down, commodity prices goes higher here 
in the United States. And that pushes inflation higher in this country. By the way, the majority of commodities trading is done via the US dollar. So that pushes inflation globally. So there is a risk even if Powell backs off, allows the euro to move higher for European inflation to go down, that it might actually backfire as we see dollarized commodities moving higher in value. This is a major dilemma that is happening right now. And the majority of the damage will happen in Europe, not in the United States. The European economy is already in severe stagflation. GDP growth is being driven down dramatically while inflation continues to linger higher. Somehow, the ECB needs to figure out a way to shore up the euro. Otherwise, they will fail in tackling inflation regardless of the aggressive interest rate hikes. And they could continue to raise interest rates all they want. All what they're going to do is dump the economy into a recession at some point. But there is no guarantee they will be able to tackle down inflation without the currency recovering. But we now have Jerome Powell and the Federal Reserve standing on the way of the ECB to tackle down this inflation properly. On the other hand, what is the Fed supposed to do? Are they supposed to ease now and allow the dollar to go down and risk inflation being revived in this country, they cannot afford to do that right now. And hence, the dilemma. Let me know what you think in the comments. But for now, I'm going to move on to cover the stock market information for you. We start with the closing of the indices today. And here we go. The Dow Industrial Average closing in the green by 193.24 points or a gain of 0.61%. The Nasdaq Closing in the green by 70.23 points or a gain of 0.60%. The S&P 500 leading the pack with gains of 26.31 points or 0.66%. The sector's performances today led by number one capturing the gold medal healthcare, number two for the silver financials, number three for the bronze materials. Yet the laggard of the day was communication services. The advance to decline ratios NYC 60% advancing versus 37% declining. The Nasdaq also 60% advancing versus 37% declining. Lots of algorithmic trading here. And hence, we're seeing the NYSE and the NASDAQ trading pretty much on par. Commodities, what's going on here? See, the dollar initially was higher in the morning and then it cooled off because the market was debating which side do we go with? The hawkish interest rate hikes by the ECB? Should we buy the euro now? Or should we buy the hawkish rhetoric from Jerome Powell and go with the dollar? Now, the market did not make up its mind yet, but my hunch is the market will go for now until the Fed's meeting or perhaps the next CPI reading, the market will go with the euro and dump the dollar. If that is the case, we will see a revival in commodities trading. The value of these commodities will shoot up higher. Today, we saw a decent day for crude oil. Both the WTI and Brent gain WTI with about 1%, Brent with a little over half a percentage point. The gasoline are Bob. Also gained a little over half a percentage point. Natural gas with gains of about 1.5%, yet heating oil futures were down by about 1.5%. Softs, we have gains led by lumber, gains of over 2.5%, followed by cotton, gains of a little over 2%. OJ also closed in the green almost by 1%, while coffee was flat for the day. On the other hand, cocoa and sugar futures traded in the red in today's session. Metals, what's going on here? See, when we say the dollar is about to go down, we need to see a confirmation by gold, the mature guy in the room. If gold doesn't pop higher, gold is questioning the apparent weakness in the dollar. As if gold is saying, not so fast. I've been fooled before. You ain't gonna fool me again. And therefore, gold was actually down by about half a percentage point today. Yet on the other hand, the action that we saw in the currency market was good enough for a rally in silver, platinum, copper, palladium, all with major gains. Palladium, for example, scored gains of about 5.5% today. When we talk about meats, the new big tech, lean hogs, leading the pack with gains of about 1%. Well, we have muted action beat in the green for both live and feeder cattle futures. What about grains? We have a rebound for soybean oil, the loser so far, for the month at least. And the rebound was worth over 2.25% today. Likewise, we have gains for rough rice, oats, and soybeans futures. On the other hand, we have losses, be it modestly for corn, yet above 1% for wheat, canola, and soybean meal futures. Now, watch out for wheat because the reason behind the drop in wheat futures is the fact that we saw wheat from Ukraine coming out of the country and being traded in the global market. Of course, the Ukrainians cannot really trade wheat out of 
their own ports without permission of the Russians. This was a deal sponsored by Turkey, and we saw a lot of wheat leaving Ukraine, and supposedly it should have gone to African countries, Middle Eastern countries, countries that really need that wheat. But according to the Russian president, Vladimir Putin, the wheat did not go to these countries, the poor countries. Instead, it went to European countries. And now he's mad. What does that mean? Are we going to see a disruption of the wheat supply from Ukraine? because that will translate into higher wheat prices. Mr. Putin added, Just as many European countries acted in previous centuries as colonialists, this is how they continue acting today. They have once again cheated the developing countries and continue cheating them. It is obvious that this approach will only intensify the scale of the global food crisis, to our great regret. And this may lead to an unprecedented humanitarian catastrophe. I don't know what this means. But it sounds as if the Russians want to back out of this deal, which once again will mean higher wheat prices. Now understand this. If the flow of wheat stops from Ukraine, this is a major supply shock. So yes, we have the headwind against wheat, which is the Fed tightening the monetary policy, which is the dollar moving higher. But suppose the dollar goes down because the Fed is backing away from the hawkish rhetoric for whatever reason. And on top of that, we get a supply shock, such as the Russians stopping the flow of wheat from Ukraine. That will mean higher wheat prices, which will mean higher food price inflation. So again, I continue to remind everybody on daily basis that if you assume that inflation is gone, that if you are in team transitory inflation, you could be sadly mistaken. The tailwinds for these futures to pop higher again are simply too strong. Once again, the Fed must not waver in their commitment of tackling inflation down. Otherwise, they get rid of the headwind allowing all of these tailwinds to push commodities prices higher again. Not just wheat, but also metals, most importantly, energy commodities. Moving on to options, the big casino, what's going on here? And folks, look at this. When I read these numbers for you, I'm not just reading them for you. You can do that on your own. What we want to know is, what do these numbers actually mean? When we talk about the volume, when we talk about the ratios, for the largest names in the stock market. For example, the volume for Tesla moved higher and it pushed that table at number one. With about 1.9 million contracts traded today, about 50.5% of those were calls. So we're seeing a battlefield in Tesla. The volume moved higher, both on calls and puts. But what about Apple at number two? At around 1.5 million contracts traded today, about 52% of those were calls. The volume of calls is moving down. The ratio was a lot higher a couple of days ago, favoring calls. Now it is moving slightly toward puts once again. And therefore, Apple is lagging the stock market today. And number three, AMD, with around 600,000 contracts traded today, about 66% of those were calls. There's no wonder why AMD outperformed the stock market today. What about the unusual activities that took place in the options market? We start with the ticker LYFT for Lyft. The name blasted higher today on the rumors that perhaps we will see a takeover. And today the rumored name was GM. Now can GM really buy Lyft and what is the advantage here? I don't know. Maybe somebody wants to pump and dump. We'll see what happens. But here we have somebody buying calls, betting for more upside for Lyft. They bought the 19 bucks calls for the expiration date, September 23rd, with the expectations that the name could move higher and gain an additional 10.5% or more by then. They paid around 55 cents apiece to enter this trade, all in all spending around $1.6 million dollars. And then what about the ticker AR for a company called Antero Resources? This is an oil and gas company based on in Denver, Colorado. Somebody sees an upside for this name. They bought the 45 calls for the expiration date, October 21st, with expectations that the name could move higher and gain more than 14.5% by then. They paid around one and a half bucks a piece to enter this trade, all in all spending around one and a half million dollars. And then what about the trade for the ticker COIN, Coin base. Now, when I did the video over the weekend for the members only, I said that one of the trades I'm eyeing for this week is buying calls on Coinbase. But we also have to look at the underlying asset, which is Bitcoin. Now, you might say, hey, Maverick, I missed on the trade because Coinbase is up big this week. The problem is Bitcoin was down. So what's up with the divergence here? Okay, you might have missed on the call options trade, but there is an upcoming put options trade on Coinbase if the prices of Bitcoin remain subdued. We'll talk about targets in the weekend video. 
But for now, somebody's already betting against the name. I think that this trade is a little too aggressive, but they could be seeing something. I don't know, because the divergence is unnatural. In any case, somebody bought the 59 puts for the expiration date, September 16th, with expectations that Coinbase could move down and lose over 19% of its value by then. They paid around 45 cents a piece to enter this trade, all in all spending around $300,000. And lastly, what about the ticker NVDA NVIDIA? Somebody sees an upside here they bought the 147 calls for the expiration date september 16th with expectations that nvidia could move higher and gain more than five percent by then and they were willing to pay one buck and 65 cents a piece to enter this trade all in all spending around nine hundred thousand dollars notice that the majority of the trades the bullish ones at least for names like nvidia and otherwise they're betting for a bounce all the way to september 16th but nothing major beyond that so once again could we see the first half of september we stopped doing better than expected because everybody was talking about September watch out for September it's gonna be really really bad and I told you in this channel watch out here because we could see the first two weeks of September being actually decent but then the pain resumes what is the catalyst for the resumption of the pain because we know what the catalyst is for the rebound it's the low volume the Fed is out of the way for now we have a shortened trading week etc etc oversold conditions that counts too but what would be the catalyst for a reversal of the rebound i can see the cpi i can see of course most importantly the fed's meeting but until then let's move on to cover the heat map analysis for today and as you can see the majority of the action was to the upside with major exceptions these major exceptions happen to come from google and apple in a day where we saw tesla blasting higher gaining about two percent the nasdaq the s&p the iwm the russell 2000 all closing in the green with major dip buying because the indices opened down it was a gap down a big one but then we saw the dip buyers so the question here is are apple and google but most importantly apple just lagging behind and soon enough we will see apple joining the rebound and rallying higher again or is apple a cautionary tale saying not so fast you can rebound all you want but you're not going to be able to do it without me look at the action in the map was the ratty led by chips for example software maybe the risk on kind of names the answer is not really the ratty today was led by value financials healthcare etc which means that for now the assumption is apple is right apple is saying not trusting this rebound at all now today we witnessed major action in healthcare specifically in biotech lots of companies popping higher 30 40 50 percent in these smaller biotech biopharma names but a major rebounder was number one moderna but most importantly regeneron the ticker regn now two days ago we talked about the xbi and how the xbi is outperforming everybody because the xbi got hit already the epic finale already happened in the xby so if you want to buy something anything right now maybe the xbi is actually a good deal now a lot of you said hey but it includes moderna and biontex and all of these names that happen to be really volatile i said i suggested if you want to pick one name if i'm going to pick one name I'm going with Regeneron. If that was not a good enough reason for you to buy Regeneron, maybe the news that we got today will convince you. The headline reads, Regeneron says retinal treatment trials met primary endpoints. The stock was up double digits today. Do you jump right away? That's up to you. If I'm not in it already, I'd wait for a pullback and then reassess and jump in. But Regeneron happens to be one of these stocks, steady eddy, good dividend, good valuations, no impulsive moves in terms of a mania that has to be corrected at all. So I remain a fan of Regeneron stock. What about the heat map for the ETFs? Once again, modestly in the green, some weakness in international markets in China and Europe, some weakness in the commodities sector, such as in gold, but no major contrast between value your growth the theme was both are in the green we have what it appears to be an algorithmic bounce led by value names value at performed slightly growth but both in the green and the gains were led once again by the xbi up over three percent and the reason is moderna regeneron blasting higher two major components of the xbi and hence the ad performance now is this action that we got today a lead for more gains to come well to answer this question we have to move on to the charts analysis i'm starting by the spy the s&p 500 30 minutes chart and as you can see the action for today is highlighted because we got a gap down a big one but immediately the dip buyers did show up right away the dip happens due 
to the ECB's interest rate hike, and of course, Jerome Powell being hawkish, or at least pretending or attempting to be hawkish. Now, is this a sign of strength or weakness? In other words, is this bullish or bearish? We have a gap down at the dip buyers, be it algos, be it short covering, doesn't matter to me. The end result is the same. But when they step in and buy the dip, is this a sign for weakness or strength? Bullish or bearish? In my book, it is bullish. It is a sign of strength. On top of that, once the SPY made it above 398, which was resistance, now support, it failed again. And that is due to the news that we got that the queen passed away. But immediately, the dip buyers showed up again. And they ended up pushing the chart all the way above 398, and they closed pretty much at the highs of the day. In my book, this is bullish, not bearish, indicating more gains to come. If we do have more gains tomorrow, remember, no major events at all. The road is clear for the bulls to do whatever they want. We could go all the way to 4 or 5. That would be the next resistance. And here is the daily chart for the continuous contract for the S&P 500. We have a weird gap in the futures contract. That shouldn't happen, which means that this gap will be closed at some point. Now, my hope, as at least a bear for now, is we see a rally that get us closer to 4100 and then we see a flush down i don't want this gap to be closed right away because leaving it open tells me a guarantee that we're going down to close this gap after all this is a continuous contract chart so it shouldn't it shouldn't behave that way but anyways today the volume moved higher on a buying day on a green day the chart is firmly above 3960 the momentum indicators are curling the way higher all of these are signs for the bulls to go ahead and continue to buy when we see a reversal that is the moment when the bears are going to double down but the bears who are not already in must not prematurely short they must seek a reversal signal whether that happens at 4100 or before that that's up for debate but for now the trajectory is more gains to come after all folks it is a shortened trading week the volume is down. The bulls have the all clear. What about the queues? 30 minutes chart. What's going on here? Once again, a dip in the morning. Bought right away. And they got us above the important resistance. Still resistance, by the way. 300.72. In most charts, it is actually 300. But I am more conservative than most. And even after the flush down, upon the news that the queen has passed, the dip buyers showed up right away. And they closed the day pretty much as close as they can to 300.72. Now we do have a sloping line of resistance, which means if we have a breakout above that line, we will see all of that energy being released. We could see a major prop higher that could take us all the way to the next resistance at around 308.55. Another rejection, however, from the same line will mean the lower lows are coming. For now, the assumption is the bulls will make it above this line, unless there is a surprise tomorrow. Here is the daily chart for the continuous contract for the NASDAQ. Once again, the mysterious gap higher. We'll see if that's going to be resolved right away or in time. In the meantime, the volume today was above average on a buying day. The negative divergence in the RSI appears to be reversed, at least for now. The MACD indicator is also curling up its way higher. We're seeing these uh, red impressions in the histogram getting shorter and shorter and shorter shorter. All of these are good signs for the bulls that they have momentum for now. But are they out of the woods? Not even close. They will be out of the woods if they recapture 12,766. But even if they do that, they have a long way to go for us to say, okay, the June bottom is safe for now. It's not. And here's the IWM 30 minutes chart for the Russell 2000, the at performer for the day. It opened gapping down, but it did close at the highs of the day most importantly above the resistance now support of 183.25 if the momentum continues we have 188 as resistance if not if after all of these factors including the shortened trading week the low volume if the iwm cannot make it above 188 then we got a problem we will most likely see lower lows too early for that conversation for now let the bulls have it and they might have it good if the dollar index, the Dixie, moves down significantly. For now, we have a pullback. It's not a reversal yet, but it is the beginning of a reversal. When we look at the candlestick pattern, likewise, when we look at the RSI in slight negative divergence, the MACD indicator, look at these green columns getting shorter and shorter and shorter, indicating the end of the bullish momentum, or perhaps the start of a bearish momentum. Now, that doesn't mean that the chart should fl just flush down. Flushing down is one option of the change of momentum. Another option could be a pullback, and another one could be a consolidation range, which is what the dollar bulls should be hoping for. Now, if the dollar moves down, it's not just going to be equities that will move higher. It will be most importantly gold. Gold continues to hold on at the most important support of 1,685. But it's indecisive yet. There is a lack of conviction here 
by gold. As if gold is saying, I'm so traumatized, I cannot even believe the dollar. Even if this is the real deal, I gotta see more. I gotta see the dollar flushing down big. And then we rally in gold. And if we do, I've been waiting for this trade for a while now. Buying call options on NEM New Mount Gold. Immediately we will see short covering and a blast higher. So I am prepared for that. I do have call options, I bought them today, but not a significant position because what if the Dixie is pulling another trick? We see the dollar moving higher tomorrow or next week and then gold flushing down again. I need to see more, but I can add to it if I am right. Next, what about a daily chart for UK oil, aka Brent oil? A nice bounce today, but insignificant. It doesn't change the downward trajectory that Brent has been on for a while now. And I'm eyeing the support of 85 to see what happens from that point on. And here's the daily chart for the 10 year yield. And a reminder, gold has two enemies. One of them is the dollar, the other is this chart, the 10 year yield. And perhaps it is the reason why gold refused to rally today, even though the dollar was looking weak. This chart is not looking weak. Yes, it is overextended in the momentum indicators, but it is once again above 3.28%. And if it continues to pop higher, the next stop will be 3.5%. I doubt that we will see a major move in the 10-year yield before the CPI next week. What does that mean for the TLT, a weekly chart? It means that we could have a closing below 109.5, which is a bad closing for the bulls when it comes to the TLT, of course. Are there any bulls remaining, by the way, in the TLT? I doubt it. And frankly speaking, when we look at a monthly chart for the TLT, we had a major curve line trend that goes all the way back since the early 2000s. That trend was broken briefly during the Fed pivot episode back in 2018-2019, but it continued after that. But now, it is broken for good. This is something that we haven't seen in at least over a decade now. So this trend is not going to be reversed anytime soon, specifically easily. But if you are betting on the Fed pivoting and moving interest rates down, or you're betting on yields moving down either way because we're going to have a recession, a lot of folks will move to the safety of bonds, we must use the Fibonacci levels and see where the next support is. When we do that, it is at around 102. So if we do have a weekly closing below 109.5, I'll be waiting all the way till 102 before I consider before I even consider buying. Anyways, the VIX 4 hours chart, what's going on here? The VIX lost the support of 24.29. The MACD indicator remains negative it is in negative momentum this is a four hours chart by the way the hour size still in negative divergence all of these are indicators that we could see the vix going back all the way to 20 once again and with that will come a rally in equities perhaps a resurgence of the mania and meme stocks etc etc and as a bear once again i hope that this will happen before the fed's meeting but even better before the cpi comes out because i want the risk to be to the downside in equities if i was a bull i actually want to see the vix popping higher i want to see equities getting absolutely crushed before the cpi and before the fed's meeting because that makes the risk to the upside. I hope this is clear, and if it's not, it's your problem. Anyways, here's Apple, a daily chart. What's going on here? Interesting candle, a doji. It means indecision, but it also means a major move coming. A major candle usually follows a doji candle. Could it be to the upside? Could it be to the downside? You see, Apple is in charge right now. The market can rally all it wants. If Apple refuses to join, the rally will be unsustainable. And Apple is not going to give us the all clear until it recaptures 157 as support by the end of this week, meaning tomorrow. Otherwise, the assumption is Apple Apple will go down further. The next support is 150. Tesla, an hourly chart. What's going on here? The bulls are firmly above 280. We'll see if they're going to close the week above 280. They got one day left, but if they do, the next resistance will be 298. The bears are not going to short until they see 280 lost the support, but better yet, the double bottom also got a support because that means the next stop would be 258.79 and then after that 248.71. Moving on to Tulips BTC, which is yet another mystery besides Apple. Why do we say that? Because Bitcoin did not rally this week, number one. Number two, Bitcoin-related equities were trading higher. Case in point, Coinbase. Yet the underlying asset, Bitcoin, was down for the week. We have some repair job going on, but they have yet to close the week above half of the body of the candle, the reversal candle. And even if they do, we're not out of the woods yet until they get us above 20,000. And therefore, I say if this, if this holds, then the action that we saw in Coinbase, for example, that's not going to hold. And that give us the opportunity for a 
put options trade this time around. Anyhow, moving on to the end of this video, the conclusion, what do we have on the economic calendar tomorrow? Not much, not much at all. We just have a bunch of Fed zombies speaking from uh, Chicago, Fed Evans. We also have Governor Waller and from Kansas City, Esther George. Please don't speak with both sides of the mouth because if you do, you're going to loosen financial conditions and you're going to find yourself having to play catch up to tie in financial conditions once again. And at some point, doing this game over and over and over again will cause the market to lose credibility in the Fed. I mean, it's already damaged, but Jerome Powell repaired some of that by saying, hey, I'm Dr. Payne. You're going to see pain in the economy and in the jobs market. And the market said, okay, okay, we get it. But now if you're going to speak with both sides of the mouth and financial conditions get loosened, what are you going to do after that? Because pain is not going to do it. You got to go even more extreme and graphic. And with that lovely thought, let's end it here. This is all I got for you for now, folks. A reminder, Sunday's video will be for members only. And with that, thank you for listening. Thank you for watching. I will talk to you again over the weekend.